Perhaps you heard the story of the finding of Lee's lost order. I bet it was told to you something like this. At 4 a.m. on September 12, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln sent a simple query dispatched from the telegraph room at the War Department to Union Commander General George B. McClellan. McClellan was at that moment on the front lines with the Union Army of the Potomac approaching Frederick. Lincoln asked McClellan simply, how does it look now? Not receiving a reply after 12 hours of waiting, Lincoln sent another how does it look now message at 4.10 p.m. According to prominent writer Stephen Sears, only one of these messages reached McClellan, and it was on the morning of the following day, September 13th. Lincoln's query, so the writer claims, made Lincoln anxious to report some sort of good news back to the president. Luckily for McClellan, shortly before 10 a.m. that same morning, a soldier of his 12th Corps stumbled upon an envelope containing three cigars and a copy of a misplaced Confederate order directly from Confederate General Robert E. Lee. This lost order revealed that Lee had broken his army into five parts. Three were to capture a Union garrison in Harper's Ferry. A fourth column was to proceed to Boonesboro, and the fifth was to act as the rear guard, along with General Jeb Stewart's three cavalry brigades. The lost order was sent up the chain of command to McClellan. You may have then read from author Stephen Sears, It was about 11.30 a.m., and McClellan was meeting with a group of local citizens regarding the federal occupation of Frederick, when his adjutant, Seth Williams, interrupted to hand him what proved to be the intelligence coup of the war. Next, a Maryland gentleman, while in McClellan's headquarters, saw that McClellan openly expressed delight. Another account states that he threw up his hands and exclaimed, Now I know what to do! Within the next 30 minutes, McClellan wrote a message to Lincoln, bragging to the president that he had all the enemy's plans and would soon send the president trophies. This trophies message was telegraphed at noon, but unfortunately did not get through to Washington until 14 hours later, supposedly due to telegraphic errors. Then, in typical McClellan fashion, he lost his nerve. Author Stephen Sears put it this way, During that Saturday afternoon, he, McClellan, appears to have plunged from exuberance down into uncertainty and then back up to confidence, and the emotional journey required some six hours. Another 12 hours would pass before a single man of the Army of the Potomac advanced in response to the lost order. McClellan just dawdled. This version of events is just wrong. First, the supposedly two How Does It Look Now telegrams are actually only one. The 4 a.m. timestamp message on the left is Lincoln's original query. The 4.10 p.m. paper on the right is not a second query from Lincoln, but is instead Lincoln's received copy of the President's original 4 a.m. message. There was only one How Does It Look Now message on September 12th, and McClellan answered it that same day in several messages to both his superiors, General and Chief Henry Halleck, and President Lincoln. As a sample, on the morning of September 12th, McClellan had already reported, My columns are pushing on rapidly to Frederick. I feel perfectly confident that the enemy has abandoned Frederick, moving in two directions, viz. on the Hagerstown and Harpers Ferry roads. Later that afternoon at 5.30 p.m., he telegraphed, I've just learned by signal from Sugarloaf Mountain that our troops are entering Frederick. The remainder of Burnside's troops are between Frederick and Newmarket. Sumner is near Urbana with our advance guard thrown out to the Monocacy. Williams on his right, Franklin on his left, Couch at Barnesville. Cavalry has been sent forward to Point of Rocks to ascertain whether there is any force of the enemy in that direction. He added, Should the enemy go towards Pennsylvania, I shall follow him. Should he attempt to recross the Potomac, I shall endeavor to cut off his retreat. My movements tomorrow will be dependent upon information to be received during the night. In summary, on September 12th, Lincoln was not left waiting for a reply from McClellan, and the next morning, McClellan was not anxious to report news to Lincoln because he had already done so the day before. Second, the account that the lost order was discovered before 10 a.m. comes from Sergeant John Bloss, one of the two soldiers who found it. He recollected on January 6, 1892, I did not observe the time when found, but it could not have been later than 10 o'clock on the 13th, and I really think it was an hour earlier. This account was written 30 years after the event, and Bloss's discovery time is directly contradicted by his commanding officer, Colonel Silas Coolgrove, who wrote five years earlier in 1887 that Bloss handed him the lost order after the 12th Corps halted for the day, which was, in Coolgrove's words, about noon. Coolgrove's 12th Corps halt time 
is supported by at least five other accounts written before his own, including three recorded on the day of the event. No accounts in the 30 years prior to 1892 have yet surfaced which state that the 12th Corps stopped marching at any time before noon. Oh, and by a separate earlier account from Bloss, which does not mention the discovery time, there are only two cigars. Third, I asked Stephen Sears for his source, which stated that McClellan was handed the lost order at 11.30 a.m. by Seth Williams while meeting with town residents about the Union occupation of Frederick, because after searching, I could not find it anywhere. He replied that his account was surmise, of course. Reasonable surmise, absolutely. Sears' story, which has been so often repeated and relied upon for modern historians, has no source. It is Sears' own invention. This story must be jettisoned and replaced with the actual primary accounts that show McClellan was riding through Frederick on horseback with Burnside at that same time. Fourth, we must question the two accounts that claim a Maryland gentleman was at McClellan's headquarters the moment the lost order was found, and that he saw McClellan have an excited reaction. Both of these accounts come secondhand from the same source. Does anybody know who that is? Confederate General Robert E. Lee. When Lee was the president of Washington College after the war, he gave these two accounts to co-workers Reverend E.C. Gordon and Professor William Allen on the same day, February 15, 1868, but in separate conversations. What Lee recounted to these two men was his memory of what Stuart had told him five years earlier, immediately after the close of the Battle of South Mountain. Strangely, for such a dramatic moment so often highlighted by historians, there are no other accounts of McClellan's supposedly very public outburst. No mention of it has surfaced from Frederick residents, none of the journalists following McClellan reported it, and no officers or generals present seem to have documented it either. We shall show that McClellan's headquarters were not set up until 3 p.m., yet it's beyond debate that the lost order had already been received by McClellan before then. A diligent historian must question, how could this Maryland man have been in McClellan's headquarters the moment that the lost order was delivered, when those headquarters had not yet been set up? How could this Maryland man have known that McClellan was reading the lost order from Lee instead of some other document? How could he learn that the paper directed the movements of Lee's army? There was a time that day when McClellan did reveal all this information, but it was not until well after dark, more than six hours after the lost order had already been placed in his hands. Fifth, the noon dispatch time of the trophies telegram comes from the War Department received carbon copy of McClellan's message, which is located in the National Archives. McClellan's original message has never been found. When the official records were compiled in the late 1800s, the authors did not have access to either McClellan's original trophies telegram or Lincoln's personal received copy of it. Instead, they used the next best thing, the War Department carbon copy of the message. Note the red war record stamp in the upper right corner of the first page. However, in 2002, historian Maurice Doust found in the Library of Congress's Lincoln Papers digital files Lincoln's received copy, which has a time stamp of 12 midnight, a sent time 12 hours later than originally thought. This made the telegraphic transmission time only 2 hours and 35 minutes, a time consistent with the rest of the telegraphic transmission times of that same day. The War Department copy with the 12M time stamp is a mistake. We know this because the exact same 12 midnight to 12M time stamp error happened only two nights earlier on September 11th. And in that case, we can clearly see that the timestamp on McClellan's original message does not match the War Department copy. Let's take a look. Here we have McClellan's original September 11th telegram, timestamp 12 midnight. Now note that on Halleck's received version, 12 midnight has been changed to 12 m for 12 meridian or noon. This mistake was then copied on the War Department's received version. And finally, the compilers of the official records simplified the 12M timestamp to noon. Again, none of the timestamps on these copies match McClellan's original 12 midnight timestamp. These errors likely happened during the complicated encryption process used to securely transmit McClellan's message by telegram, where timestamps were changed to code words. The exact same 12 midnight to 12M error happened again only two days later with McClellan's September 13th trophies telegram. Not coincidentally, judging by the handwriting, the same War Department operator who had written out the telegram to Halleck also wrote out the new trophies telegram to Lincoln. The difference being that it appears someone noticed the mistake, 
likely Lincoln himself, and corrected it. Finally, Mr. Sears' outrageous claim that not one Union soldier advanced in response to the lost order for 18 hours is absolutely baseless, and we shall prove tonight the utter absurdity of such an accusation. In fact, McClellan's army never ceased pursuing Lee on September 13th, from the break of dawn until well past midnight. How do we know this? The process is simple but time-consuming. We take every official report, correspondence, letter, diary entry, telegram, signal dispatch, newspaper article, and unit history that can be found pertaining to September 13th and put them in the chronological order and then plot them out on a map. So what actually did happen? On September 13, 1862, Reveille was sounded as early as 3 a.m. for the 2nd and 12th Corps. The 6th Corps was likely roused at the same time, as all three corps were on the march by sunrise. Pleasanton's cavalry were up, too. When dawn broke, they cantered out of their bivouac on the west side of Frederick to seize the Catoctin Passes. High atop Hagen's Pass, where the National Road crosses the Catoctin Mountains, Rebel horsemen of the Jeff Davis Legion tracked the Union cavalry as they advanced from Frederick. Brigadier General Wade Hampton's brigade, along with Stuart, was encamped near Middletown. Upon learning of the Union cavalry advance, Stuart ordered Hampton's cavalry with two rifle cannons up the mountain to help defend the pass. Pleasanton's troopers on the plain below soon skirmished with the Rebel troops. Both sides wheeled artillery into position, and a lively artillery exchange began. This duel was noticed by the Union signal station on Sugarloaf Mountain some 12 miles away. Signal officer Albert Meyer reported, The sounds of a cannonade attracting attention early in the morning. The position of the guns at Catoctin Pass, west of Frederick, was at once reported to General McClellan near Urbana. The time this occurred was not specific, but telegraphic operators in Damascus and Poolsville submitted three reports which indicate that the artillery duel began between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. McClellan was already awake, according to Joseph Tabor of the headquarters guard, who wrote that McClellan left Urbana for Frederick at about 7 o'clock a.m. This seems unlikely, though, because a half an hour later, McClellan sent two telegrams from headquarters, still apparently at Urbana. McClellan's headquarters guard, the 93rd New York Infantry, had the job of protecting the headquarters train while on the march and of setting up and taking down the tents whenever a change of camp was made. Robert Robertson of this unit wrote that by the time the train departed for Frederick, it was 8 a.m. From the information above, we can surmise that McClellan left the vicinity of Urbana sometime between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock a.m. Back at Haken's Gap on Catoctin Mountain, Pleasanton sent for help from Burnside, who reported that a portion of General Rodman's division, Harlan's brigade, was sent to the main body under General Pleasanton, and the remainder, Fairchild's brigade, sent to report to Colonel Rush of the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Rodman's two brigades were encamped on the south side of Frederick at the city hospital compound of the old Hessian barracks. Corporal George Allen of Harlan's brigade recorded that his unit moved out at 9 o'clock and that their line of march took them through Frederick City. Meanwhile, Sumner's Corps advanced the seven miles on the Georgetown Turnpike to the outskirts of Frederick. Marching down the slope to the Monocacy River, they could see and hear the fight in Hagen's Gap, its members recording the following. Richard Derby wrote, We could see the smoke of the cannonading on the mountains across the valley as we came down into Frederick. Colonel Edward Cross added that his unit came in full view of the beautiful valley in which Frederick is located. The booming cannon and puffs of smoke from the far-off hillside showed where the rear of the enemy was covering the retreat. The head of the long column crossed the Monocacy River and covered the final three miles to Frederick, stopping just short of entering the city. At least three accounts state that the 2nd Corps reached Monocacy Junction at 10 o'clock a.m. Thomas Aldrich states his unit crossed the Monocacy River at about 10 o'clock, where we halted for over an hour, feeding our horses and looking out also for our own rations. Sergeant John H. Rhodes recounted of his battery, we marched through Monocacy Mills, a thriving little village situated on the Monocacy River. The battery made a halt of two hours. Since they resumed their march at noon, this means that they halted at 10 a.m. Jonathan Stowe wrote, Arrive at Railroad Junction at 10 a.m. Halt often. Stowe also recorded, 
evidence of rebel destruction of railroad bridge at Junction. Lieutenant Edgar Newcomb echoed, the railroad bridge has been burned by the rebels, though strangely enough, the highway bridge across the same stream, Monocacy, remained intact. And he added, the telegraph was down the whole way along. Near Frederick, we halted and formed for a review. McClellan called up the Sumner's men while they halted between the Monocacy River and Frederick. A Washington Evening Star journalist reported, On our way hither this morning from Urbana, after crossing the Monocacy, General McClellan and staff passed through General Sumner's Corps, who opened their ranks for that purpose. Captain Boyd wrote that after his regiment stopped near Frederick City, General McClellan passed with his bodyguard. Troops of the 130th Pennsylvania remembered, Before we entered the city, General McClellan, with a brilliant staff, rode up the turnpike through our corps. While still watering their artillery horses in the Monocacy, Rhode Islander Aldrich remembered, General McClellan passed us on the road, and there was the usual cheering. McClellan himself recounted of the journey, In riding into Frederick, I passed through Sumner's Corps, which I had not seen for some time. The men and officers were so enthusiastic as to show that they had lost none of their old feeling. The Second Corps then rested on the turnpike until noon. After riding the length of Sumner's Corps, staff member Strother recorded that McClellan, entered Frederick City at about 10 o'clock. However, the Washington Evening Star reporter recorded, General McClellan and his staff entered at 11 o'clock. Considering the accounts that McClellan passed through the Second Corps after it stopped at 10 a.m., the entry time into Frederick of 11 a.m. appears to be more realistic. Once in town, McClellan was stopped cold by thousands of celebrating residents. The Harper's Weekly Journalist reported, the general rode through the town on a trot, and the street was filled six or eight deep with his staff and guard riding on behind him. The general had his head uncovered and received gracefully the salutations of the people. Staff member Strother recorded, Old men rushed out and barred the passage of our cavalcade to grasp the hand of McClellan. Ladies brought out bouquets and flowers to decorate his horse. Fathers held up their children for a kiss and a recognition. Joseph Tabor of the headquarters guard wrote, such excitement I never saw before. Flags flying, men and women cheering and waving hats and flags all seemed to be perfectly crazy with joy. The general stopped at the corners of two of the main streets and received the inhabitants' congratulations. Here the journalist for Harper's Weekly recalled, When the general came to the corner of the principal street, the ladies thronged around him. I've never witnessed such a scene. The general took the gentle hands which were offered to him, with many a kind and pleasing remark, and heard and answered the many remarks and compliments with which the people accosted him. Frederick resident Ann Schaefer entered in her diary, Leaping down the steps, we ran to the square and were among the first ladies to grasp his hand. Shouts and deafening cheers. People seemed besides themselves and forced him to stop, to receive their greetings. He sat as one confounded, the enthusiasm so unexpected, while ladies hung upon his horse's neck, patting his head, struck a flag in the gearing. McClellan recorded his perspective in a letter to his wife, Mary Ellen. I was nearly overwhelmed and pulled to pieces. In truth, I was seldom more affected than I was by the scenes I saw yesterday. McClellan added in his biography, They clung around old Dan's neck and almost suffocated the old fellow, decking him out with flags. Staff member Strother wrote, Riding around several streets, the general at length took the turnpike towards Baltimore, and in the eastern suburbs stopped to visit Burnside, who was encamped there. No specifics of this conversation have yet surfaced, but they certainly discuss Pleasanton's ongoing attempt to gain the Catoctin Mountain Passes and how the two corps of Burnside's wing should be repositioned now that the rest of the army was in close supporting distance at Frederick. It appears that McClellan decided to draw to Frederick the three divisions of Hooker's 1st Corps, currently spread 50 miles east along the National Road, and to advance Cox's IX Corps Division in support of Pleasanton's attack. We can deduce this because at noon, immediately following this meeting, orders to that effect were received by Cox and the division commanders of the 1st Corps. Meanwhile, Pleasanton had made little headway in seizing the heights from Stuart. Stuart's position in the Catoctins was strong. Here is von Bork of Stuart's staff recorded, The position was extremely favorable for defense. No other passage to the right or the left led across the mountain spur, and our two batteries, posted the great advantage, 
played with telling effect upon the numerous guns of the enemy in the open flat below, which, not being able to get the necessary elevation, proved almost harmless to us. This situation no doubt frustrated Pleasanton. Sometime before 11 a.m., Pleasanton scrawled out the following update to McClellan. Have met the rear guard at this point. They did have rifled guns and some 1,500 cavalry in a commanding position. They are now commanding the road with two, but until I can flank them, they cannot be dislodged. I've sent for some infantry. When it comes up, I shall try and bag the party. Just then, Harlan's brigade arrived from Frederick. Pleasanton directed the infantry to work around the Confederate left flank by Shookstown and take the gap. Having already signed this message, Pleasanton added a postscript which read, Infantry is up and going round to the right, my cavalry skirmishing dismounted and working well round the right and left of the ridge which the enemy have planted themselves. Pleasanton time-stamped his message at 11 a.m. and then sent it on to McClellan. When Pleasanton's message actually reached McClellan is unknown. Even if the message reached McClellan before he left Burnside's headquarters, five hours of fighting had brought Pleasanton no closer to controlling the pass, and it's hard to believe that McClellan was not already well aware of that. To the south, and after 11 a.m., Fairchild's brigade reached the foot of Jefferson Pass to reinforce the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Fairchild deployed his brigade to get around the Confederate left flank. In response, Munford's rebel cavalry replied with an artillery bombardment from the pass. From Frederick, it could now be seen that two passes in the Catoctin Range were contested. McClellan's meeting with Burnside could not have lasted long because McClellan returned to the south entrance of Frederick before noon. Joseph Tabor wrote that after visiting Burnside, we turned around a corner near the end of town to review the troops. This return journey is confirmed by town resident Ann Schaefer, who added, Again McClellan and Burnside passed through town, and now indeed came an army, began passing at noon, continued marching as rapidly as possible until night. What she witnessed was the head of Sumner's Corps entering Frederick. Besides Ann Schaefer's recollection, the accounts from the members of the 2nd Corps verifying McClellan's location in Frederick at noon and afterwards are substantial. Charles Willoughby entered in his diary, We passed through Frederick City about 12 o'clock. Hosea Favel wrote, This morning, march for Frederick City, arriving in the afternoon. We were received with open arms by the inhabitants. Rhodes wrote for his unit's history, At noon we resumed our onward march, and crossing the Monocacy River, entered Frederick. Jonathan Stowe jotted in his diary, passing a review of Generals Mack and Burnside at noon and bivouac half mile from Frederick. While McClellan reviewed the Second Corps, fortune shined brightly down upon him. Just a few miles away, soldiers of General Alpheus Williams' 12th Corps were discovering Lee's lost order and rushing it up the chain of command. Earlier in the day, the 12th Corps was to complete their march on the rickety road from Iamsville to the outskirts of Frederick. John Gould of the 10th Maine wrote, Reveille at 3.30, marched at 7, passed over the railroad to Iamsville, then took the fields on the right of the road. 12th Corps Commander Alphaeus Williams recalled in a letter a week later, We marched to Frederick, expecting an attack all the way. Gould continued, By and by, in emerging from some woods, the valley of the Monocacy came into view. The 10th Maine Regimental Historian then added, We saw, however, that all was not at peace. For across in two of the mountain notches, or gaps as they call them there, we could see artillery firing. Since the rebel artillery fire at Jefferson Pass did not start until after 11 a.m., 12th Corps members could not have simultaneously seen the fighting at Hagen's and Jefferson's passes until that time or afterwards. Williams' long line of troops descended the slope and waded through the Monocacy River. They marched up the gentle incline on the opposite side and encamped. All accounts written prior to 1892, without exception, state that the 12th Corps ended their September 13th march at about noon or later. Here we have 10 accounts showing that the 12th Corps did not halt their march until around noon. The first three are diary entries written on that very day. The first is written by Alphaeus Williams, the Corps commander for the 12th Corps. He wrote, I reached this near Frederick this noon, having forded the Monocacy with my own corps. The second account by Lieutenant Colonel Newton Colby of the 107th New York Infantry wrote, We forded the Monocacy, arrived in the afternoon, 
and encamped about a mile east of the city. The third account is from Sergeant C.D.M. Broomhall of the 124th Pennsylvania Infantry, and he also wrote, We halted about a mile from Frederick City at 1 p.m. The rest are additional accounts written after the war. Again, we could find no accounts written in the first 30 years after the war ended, stating that the Corps halted any time before noon. At the very front of the column in a skirmish line was Sergeant John Bloss of the 27th Indiana Regiment. In a letter written 12 days later, after being wounded at Antietam, he recorded, Our regiment was in the advance. I had the first platoon of our company as skirmishers. While settling down after the march, one of Bloss's comrades noticed an envelope nearby and retrieved it. Bloss recounted, We found the dispatch out in a wheat field under a locust tree, with two cigars in it. Bloss also wrote, Corporal B.W. Mitchell was very fortunate at Frederick. He found General Lee's plan of attack on Maryland and what each division of his army was to do. I was with him when he found it and read it first. I seen its importance and took it to the colonel. Unfortunately, Bloss did not record in his letter the time this happened. However, Colonel Coolgrove, who commanded the regiment, will recall, the 12th Army Corps arrived at Frederick, Maryland about noon on the 13th of September, 1862. We stacked arms on the same ground that had been occupied by General D. H. Hill's division the evening before. Within a very few minutes after halting, the order was brought to me by First Sergeant John M. Bloss and Private, who was actually a corporal, B. W. Mitchell of Company F, 27th Indiana Volunteers, who stated that it was found by Private Mitchell near where they had stacked arms. After reading the lost order, Coolgrove recalled, I was at once satisfied that the order was a genuine order of General Lee giving the movement of each and every corps of his army. Bloss added in his letter of September 25th, he, Coolgrove, immediately took it to General Gordon. He said it was worth a mint of money and sent it to General McClellan. Coolgrove recounted, General A.S. Williams was in command of our division. I immediately took the order to his headquarters and delivered it to Colonel S.C. Pittman, General Williams, Adjutant General. Pittman read the letter and recognized the handwriting and signature of Confederate Colonel R.H. Chilton. In a post-war letter to Coolgrove on June 9, 1886, Pittman recounted, I remember handling the order, for as Colonel Chilton had only a short time before been stationed at Detroit, and then serving as Assistant Adjutant General with General Lee, and his signature being on the order, it particularly attracted my attention. General Williams, who was now aware of the letter, directed Pittman to send the lost order to McClellan with this accompanying note. General, I enclose a special order of General Lee commanding Rebel Army, which was found on the field where my corps is encamped. It is a document of interest and is also thought genuine. Pittman continued, After writing a brief note to General McClellan's Assistant Adjutant General to accompany the order, I commenced a hurried copy. But before I could get two lines copied, General Williams inquired whether the paper had gone forward to General McClellan and would not consent to the delay of even a few moments, and I had to go without the much-coveted copy. Judging by the fact that Bloss, Coolgrove, Gordon, Pittman, and Williams each took time to read Lee's dispatch, and considering that the lost order traveled some distance between each reader, certainly more than an hour passed as the lost order traveled up the chain of command to Williams. With cover copy and the lost order in hand, a courier left Williams to find McClellan. Who this messenger was remains a mystery, but it's unlikely he left Williams until after 1 p.m. At that time, long blue lines of Union troops flowed west to north. To the east, all of Hooker's First Corps was now on the move. Meade's division had just crossed the Monocacy. King's division marched from Newmarket, and Ricketts' division moved out from Ridgeville, still some 14 miles from Frederick. To the west, Pleasanton announced to McClellan in a message time-stamped 1 p.m., that Hagen's Gap was now in Union hands. He reported, Have carried the rebel with my cavalry and artillery. Infantry too late. Pleasanton's troopers poured through the pass and into the valley beyond. Ahead, rebel cavalry retreated through the town of Middletown, crossed over Catoctin Creek, and burned the bridge and some outbuildings behind them. A huge plume of smoke rose up from the valley. To the southwest, Jefferson Pass fell too. Colonel Rush's 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry advanced directly on the Gap, while the Federal infantry attacked on both flanks. Lieutenant Matthew Graham of Fairchild's brigade recounted, 
From the summit of the ridge, over which a portion of the regiment now passed in skirmishing order, the whole valley, stretching away to South Mountain, lay exposed. Far to the northward, the village of Middletown was in flames, which confirms that Jefferson Pass was seized after 1 p.m. South of Frederick, a telegraph repair crew arrived at Monocacy Junction. They had fixed the Washington Telegraph line to this point and now planned to run the wire across the Monocacy River, reconnecting the lines to Harper's Ferry, downtown Frederick, and Baltimore. Telegraph operator Bickford reported to Washington, Arrived here at 1 p.m. Railroad bridge total wreck. Lying down as far as can see. General McClellan is reported to have passed beyond Frederick about a half hour ago. Heavy firing apparently at Harper's Ferry. As soon as can run wire, we'll proceed to Frederick. The War Department received this message almost instantaneously, timestamping the received copy at 12.55 p.m. Bickford's watch was obviously not perfectly synced to the clocks at the War Department because the received time was five minutes earlier than the sent time. But two things are clear. A working telegraph line from Washington was now only three miles from Frederick, and there was currently no telegraphic delay. Although Bickford had heard the rumor that McClellan exited Frederick, the general was still in town. The Signal Corps reported to McClellan at Frederick at about 1 p.m. that no enemy was apparently near the Army's left. At that time, the tail end of the massive procession of Sumner's Second Corps seemed to have been halted momentarily to allow Sturgis's Ninth Corps Brigade to pass through the town in support of Cox, likely per the pre-noon McClellan-Burnside meeting. The 21st Massachusetts recounted, Soon afternoon, we received marching orders and passed through the main street of the beautiful old town of Frederick. On our passage through the town, we witnessed General McClellan's enthusiastic reception. The 35th Massachusetts published, By the middle of the afternoon, the skirmish in front of Catoctin had abated. At a corner of the streets, General McClellan, with his staff, reviewed the troops, and cheer after cheer rent the air as the regiments passed. About this time, 1st Corps General George G. Meade, who had been promoted to division commander only the day before, rode into town in search of McClellan. He recorded, Today I have seen General McClellan, who was very civil and polite. I only saw him for a few minutes, surrounded by a great crowd. Meade added, The enemy have retired in the direction of Hagerstown. Where they have gone, or what their plans are, is as yet involved in obscurity, and I think our generals are a little bit puzzled. After Sturgis moved through, the remainder of Sumner's 2nd Corps continued their march north through town. Captain Boyd recorded, We marched through Frederick City at 1.30 p.m. General McClellan and Sumner, we passed in the street. Each company cheered as they passed. Afterwards, McClellan rode west to speak directly with General Jacob Cox. Cox published in his memoirs, About noon, I was ordered to march upon the latter road, the National Road, to Middletown. This order certainly came out of the McClellan-Burnside meeting that took place shortly before noon. Cox ordered his two brigades to assemble. Edward Schwitzer of the 30th Ohio from Cox's division was patrolling Frederick when he was recalled to march. He wrote, I left the city at 1 o'clock p.m., and that by the time he arrived back at the divisional camp, he noted, Regiment was falling into leave. Martin Sheets of the 11th Ohio Infantry wrote that his regiment did not move until about 2 p.m. This is when McClellan arrived. As Cox continued in his memoir, McClellan himself met me as my column moved out of town and told me of the misunderstanding with Rodman's orders, adding that if I found him on the march, I should take his division along with me. After meeting with Cox, at about 2 p.m., McClellan rode to the Steiner Farm, northwest of Frederick, where the headquarters wagon train caught up with him. John Haverty of McClellan's headquarters guard wrote, We marched through Frederick City. We got there at 3 o'clock. Robert Robertson of the same unit recorded, we encamped about a mile north of the city in a field near the reservoir. Joseph Tabor agreed with Haverty's time noting, we arrived at camp about 3 o'clock p.m. Staff member Strother did not note the time, but he recorded, we encamped a short distance to the west of Frederick in a pleasant clover field. Sometime in the early afternoon, after 1 p.m. and certainly before 3 p.m., perhaps just after McClellan's meeting with Cox, the courier with the lost order found McClellan. Only two first-hand accounts have surfaced about the receipt of the lost order, and both come directly from McClellan. The first, McClellan wrote that very night to Halleck at 11 p.m., an order from General Robert E. Lee, addressed to General D.H. Hill, which has accidentally come into my hands this evening, discloses some of the plans of the enemy. The second account, McClellan wrote in 1879 to the son of Corporal Mitchell, 
there was handed to me by a member of my staff a copy, original, of one of General Lee's orders of March, directed to General D.H. Hill, which order developed General Lee's intended operations for the next few days, and was a very great service to me in enabling me to direct the movements of my own troops accordingly. McClellan gives no other details of where or when the courier found him. As already mentioned, no other accounts of McClellan receiving the lost order have surfaced, except the second-hand versions from Robert E. Lee, who himself heard it second-hand from Jeb Stewart five years earlier. McClellan clearly felt the need to authenticate this lost order, because he had a copy made, then sent to Pleasanton with the following order. General McClellan desires you to ascertain whether this order of March has thus far been followed by the enemy. The message was time-stamped at 3 p.m. and sent off to Pleasanton. Tabor likely accompanied the courier to the front as he wrote, When we arrived at camp at about 3 o'clock p.m., I received orders to go with Lieutenant Bowen out to General Pleasanton's headquarters, who was in the advance. Tabor and Bowen galloped over Catoctin Mountain, and after what Tabor described as a sharp ride of about eight miles, found Pleasanton in the evening beyond Middletown. There was no 18-hour delay before McClellan's army advanced after Lee. In fact, from sunrise to past midnight on September 13th, McClellan's army never stopped moving west. McClellan's receipt of the lost order in the early afternoon merely confirmed to him that his army was already going in the right direction. Only 35 minutes after setting up his headquarters, McClellan again ordered Cox's division forward. That it was the intention for you to proceed direct to Middletown, and McClellan desires that you will march to that place and support General Pleasanton. Pick up Rodney, if you should find him, and take him with you to Middletown. Unknown to McClellan, Harlan's lost brigade of Robin's division was already in Middletown. While Pleasanton's cavalry dislodged Stewart's troopers in Hagen's Gap, Harlan's brigade had made a wide flanking movement through Shookstown Gap. Captain Marsh of that brigade recounted, Skirmishers were thrown out, and we commenced descending the mountain, but up it we went and wound around to the left again and down into another valley, where we came to another village called Middletown, but were not in time to get any rebel. Pleasanton pursued Stuart to the base of South Mountain and met resistance. He called on Harlan's footsore soldiers for support. Marsh wrote, We had not rested for more than an hour before we marched outside of town and formed in line of battle not knowing if the enemy intended to attack us as they had driven in our cavalry. About the same time, on the other side of Frederick, the other brigade of Sturgis' division advanced west on the National Road from the vicinity of the Jug Bridge over the Monocacy. The 48th Pennsylvania recorded, The start on the 13th was not made until 3.30 p.m. The Green 9th New Hampshire, before they marched through Frederick, noted, At 4 o'clock, the 9th showed up in a brigade line for the first time. Soon afterwards, Wilcox's division also marched for Middletown. David Lane of that division wrote, Towards evening of the 13th, we left Frederick City and marched out on the National Turnpike towards South Mountain. Corporal Frederick Pettit, also of Wilcox's division, echoed in a letter, In the evening, we took up our march through Frederick towards Middletown. Wilcox moved out so quickly that members of the 79th New York Infantry on picket duty since the night before were unable to catch up. William Todd of that regiment wrote, On returning to our bivouac at 4 o'clock the following afternoon, this is September 13th, we found the army had moved forward. By late afternoon, all of Reno's Ninth Corps was moving to confront Lee. Army Surgeon Thomas Ellis of the Ninth Corps published a year later, For hours, the long lines of men, horses, and artillery kept passing through the town, and it was not until near midnight that the monster military procession had drawn to a close. At Jefferson's Pass, Irwin's brigade pushed skirmishers out to cover the town of Jefferson, while Colonel Rush's cavalry hurried towards Harper's Ferry, but met resistance halfway to Petersville. Smith reported to Franklin at 4 p.m., I learned from Colonel Rush that the enemy are in strong force at Petersville. I thus ordered the three regiments, 3rd Brigade, Colonel Stoughton, and the battery here, where I wait further orders from you. It's also reported that the attack at Harper's Ferry is from the forces on this side of the river, and an attack from us in the rear might possibly be deemed advisable if it coincides with the General-in-Chief's plan. Franklin, in turn, dutifully forwarded Smith's message to McClellan and added, The forces available from this corps 
now at Jefferson or its vicinity, are one brigade and one battery from General Smith's division. Smith's men were certainly anxious for a fight, but just out of view on the other side of South Mountain were ten Confederate infantry brigades and a brigade of cavalry with ample artillery support. Frustrating as it must have been for Irwin and Fairchild's brigades to remain as spectators, for the moment the Confederate forces greatly outgunned and outnumbered them. While Franklin's message made its way to McClellan, the telegraph line to Point of Rocks from Monocacy Junction was fixed. Having toiled for four hours with his repair crew at Monocacy Junction, Operator Bickford reported to the War Department at 5 p.m., We've got the line strung across the river and built to Old Office. Line down very badly between here and Frederick. Three miles. We want wire and materials to get both wires up. Have seen members of Brigade General Kimball's staff who promised to inform commanders that we were in communication. Bickford's message was received by the War Department without delay only an hour and 40, 40 minutes later at 6.40 p.m. The War Department could now send and receive messages from Point of Rocks, where a signal station had been established earlier in the day under the command of Lieutenant J.H. Frolic. With the line now open, Frolic reported, there was a heavy firing at the north side of the Blue Ridge until 3.30 p.m. This telegram also made it through to the War Department without delay, arriving at 5 p.m., less than an hour and a half after it was sent. Frolic also signaled to the Sugarloaf Mountain Station, who in turn, at 4 p.m., signaled to the Graveyard Signal Station in Frederick for McClellan that, The enemy are in Pleasant Valley. They are moving from Jefferson in the direction of Harper's Ferry. A heavy column can be seen at Jefferson. Bickford Station had now been operational and in direct communication with the War Department for four hours. During the entire time, it had been open only a few miles from McClellan as he moved about Frederick. All three known transmission times took well under two hours to submit. Bickford Station was an extension to the same telegraph line that McClellan had used since the start of the campaign. Had McClellan sent any telegrams from Frederick previous to 5 p.m., they certainly would have found Bickford and gotten through to the War Department by 6.30 p.m. Meanwhile, two miles north of Monoxy Junction, King's Division of Hooker's 1st Corps joined Meade's Pennsylvania Reserves in bivouac. One member recorded, We reached the bank of the Monocacy on Saturday evening. Among the officers of the division was Brigadier General John Gibbon, commander of the soon-to-be-famous Iron Brigade. After putting his brigade into bivouac, Gibbon sought out McClellan. He wrote, Hearing that General McClellan's headquarters were in the suburbs of the place, I rode there to see him. From 3.35 to 5.45 p.m., it appears that McClellan plotted out additional movements for the rest of the army based on the contents of the lost order as little was seen of him during this time, and by 6.20 p.m. he would explain to Franklin his full marching plans. Frederick resident Dr. Lewis Steiner, whose property McClellan's headquarters was on, wrote, In the afternoon I found McClellan with a large portion of his army encamped on my farm west of Frederick. The nature of the camp and its arrangements prevented one from forming any other conclusion than that it was a bivouac and only intended for temporary occupation. Some onward movement of the army was evidently already in contemplation, but what it might be was kept concealed in the breast of the general commanding. In the hour before sunset, McClellan began to issue orders. He started with a message at 5.45 p.m. for Captain William Sanders of the 6th U.S. Cavalry to advance from the mouth of the Monocacy River to Jefferson, push scouts out towards Harper's Ferry, and open communications with Pleasanton. Five minutes later, McClellan responded to Signal Officer Frolic's note from Point of Rocks. General McClellan thinks it's Franklin's Corps that is seen at Jefferson. He was to march there this morning. Find this out definitely, if possible. Also, whether the troops seen moving from Jefferson towards Harper's Ferry are not Franklin's, and report here as quickly as you can. McClellan then started a lengthy set of orders for Franklin. About this time, Gibbon arrived at McClellan's headquarters. Gibbon wrote in his memoirs that McClellan's camp was pitched in a field near the edge of town. Seated in McClellan's tent, I witnessed what to me was a very interesting sight, in strong contrast to what I had been accustomed for several weeks past. Colburn, Sandy as he was usually called, was seated at a table writing at McClellan's dictation, and as McClellan gave his orders, I got some insight into the military condition of affairs. Gibbon called out one example of McClellan's conversation. Colburn, Send orders to Franklin that tomorrow he must use his artillery freely 
no matter if he has anybody to shoot at or not. I want Miles at Harper's Ferry to know that we are coming. Gibbon assessed, like a skillful dive, he seemed to have his team well in hand and be able to judge at once whether the reports made to him were correct or not, without excitement, very quiet, not even a vexed tone in his voice, much less anything approaching an oath. His mind seemed clear and ready to receive and digest the impressions made upon it. As the sun set at 6.20, McClellan sent his finished message to Franklin, disclosing, I have now full information as to the movements and intentions of the enemy. McClellan detailed how Lee divided his army into five parts and reasoned that Colonel Miles and Harper's Ferry was still fighting. McClellan explained his plan for the rest of the Union Army. The whole of Burnside's command, including Hooker's Corps, marched this evening and early tomorrow morning, followed by the corps of Sumner and Banks and Sykes Division upon Boonesboro to carry that position. McClellan directed Franklin to seize the pass over South Mountain at Burkittsville and cut off, destroy, or capture McClellan's command and relieve Colonel Miles. My general idea is to cut the enemy in two and beat him in detail. I ask of you, at this important moment, all your intellect and the utmost activity that a general can exercise. McClellan added, General Smith's dispatch of 4 p.m. with your comments is received. If, with the full knowledge of all the circumstances, you consider it preferable to crush the enemy at Petersville before undertaking the movement I have directed, you are at liberty to do so. At the time Franklin's orders were issued, McClellan had not yet received any report from Pleasanton to validate the lost order. The last I heard from Pleasanton, McClellan wrote to Franklin, he occupied Middletown after several sharp skirmishes. Pleasanton's evaluation, however, had just been sent from the base of South Mountain only five minutes earlier at 6.15 p.m. His message would inform McClellan, As near as I can judge, the order of march of the enemy that you sent me has been followed as closely as circumstances would permit. This news, when it arrived, was certainly something McClellan could rejoice over. It was sent by courier because the signal line from Middletown was not working. A half hour later, at 6.45 p.m., after the last daylight had faded, McClellan issued an order to General Darius Couch to call in all your command that you have left behind, entrusting the guarding of the fords, etc., to the cavalry. March at once for Jefferson with your whole division. The next message, at 7.15 p.m., placed Sanders' cavalry under Franklin's orders. It was now dark outside, but McClellan's army continued to move. The last of Hooker's corps followed over the Monocacy River on the National Pike and went into camp. One regimental history recorded, at 6.30 p.m., camped on the banks of the Monocacy. Another published, at nightfall, crossed over the Monocacy on a new stone bridge and bivouacked in a field a little below. Ahead on the National Pike, soldiers of the Ninth Corps continued on towards Middletown. One member wrote, Darkness gathered, but the march was continued. The road was ascending, passing over the Catoctin range of hills. Another recalled, through the city, beyond the city, along the flinty and dusty pike, the line drags wearily along. The Catoctins grow nearer, the sun sinks behind them, and the men clamber up the steep ascent. The moon is high above them, and still they plod along in strange, weird, and ghostly procession. They pass the summit and begin the descent. Far as the eye can reach, the spectral line, but dimly described in the distance, stretches away in the valley before them, as before it had lengthened behind. At the front of Reno's line, Harlan's brigade went into camp at the base of South Mountain, and Cox's division followed in behind them. James Rudolph of the 23rd Ohio wrote, Get in camp after dark. Just as we get our fires and coffee going, have to change camps. Another member wrote, We stopped about 9 o'clock near a bridge burned by the rebels. The remainder of Smith's division of Franklin's 6th Corps was on the move too. Smith had already ordered the Vermont Brigade forward, and now Hancock's brigade advanced. One member wrote, We received orders to march at 8 o'clock this evening and marched over the ridge and camped at Jefferson Town at 10 o'clock tonight. Another confirmed, At 9 o'clock last night, September 13th, we took up our march across Catoctin Mountain. At 9.30, as we climbed the mountainside, the moon rose beautifully, lighting up the hill and valley and shrub and tree. A march of four miles carried us over the mountain, and we bivouacked in Middleton Valley, one of the prettiest countries I ever saw, in the shrubs of the pleasant and flourishing little village of Jefferson. Franklin, who had approved this movement, wrote to McClellan at 10 p.m. I have received your orders from Captain Albert. Understand them, and would do my best to carry them out. 
My command will commence its movement at 5.30 a.m. Back at McClellan's headquarters, couriers and the Signal Corps brought fresh news from the front. Requests for ammunition and supplies came in from field commanders. Officers like John Gibbon waited their turn to speak. All the while, telegrams came in from the likes of Pennsylvania Governor Curtin, General in Chief Halleck, and President Lincoln. By this time, Pleasanton's message validating Lee's plans had certainly reached McClellan. For sure, McClellan now knew what to do. At 8.45, McClellan sent Halleck a brief update telegram. We occupy Middletown and Jefferson, the whole force of the enemy in front. They are not retreating into Virginia. Look well to Chambersburg. Shall lose no time. We'll soon have a decisive battle. In a second message, also time-stamped 8.45 p.m., McClellan ordered Sumner to move at 7 a.m. the following morning and send this evening his wagons to Monocacy Junction to receive supplies from a recently arrived train. Fifteen minutes later, at 9 p.m., in separate letters, McClellan informed Sykes and Pleasanton of the supply train as well. Additionally, McClellan directed Pleasanton to fire occasionally a few artillery shots, even though no enemy be in your front to fire at, so as to let Colonel Miles at Harper's Ferry know that our troops are near him. Shortly after this time, McClellan openly expressed delight that he held these plans. General Gordon, who was still waiting to speak in person with McClellan, recalled, as it grew later and only one or two staff officers remained in the tent, he, McClellan, expressed himself freely in regard to his movements, and taking from his pocket a folded paper, he said, Here's a paper with which, if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home. He spoke cheerfully and confidently and added, I will not show you the document now, but there, turning down one of the folds, is the signature, showing R.H. Chilton, Adjutant General, and it gives the movement of every division of Lee's army. Tomorrow, we will pitch into a center, and if you people will only do two good hard days marching, I will put Lee in a position he will find hard to get out of. After the conversation, Gibbon wrote that he was impressed with McClellan's confident tone and in better spirits than I've been in for a month, feeling confident that we had at our head a general who knew his business and was bound to succeed. Since the previous day, McClellan had been confident that Lee was no longer a threat to Washington or his army's rear. The previous night, he had telegraphed Halleck, I have ordered Banks to send eight new regiments to relieve parts of Couch's command. These men had been guarding the Potomac. To this message, McClellan had received a blistering response from Halleck sent from the War Department at 10 a.m. that morning. When in the evening Halleck's message was delivered to McClellan is unknown. Halleck wrote, General Banks cannot safely spare eight new regiments from here. You must remember that very few troops are now received from the north, nearly all being stopped to guard the railroad. Halleck added, Until you know more certainly the enemy's force south of the Potomac, you are wrong in thus uncovering the capital. Halleck now rebuked, You attach too little importance to the capital. I assure you that you are wrong. The capture of this place will throw us back six months if it should not destroy us. Beware of the evils I now point out to you. You saw them when here, but seem to forget them in the distance. No more troops can be sent from here till we have fresh arrivals from the north. A careful study of the troops available to defend Washington reveals that after the departure of Porter's Corps, Banks still had 63,000 troops present for duty in the Washington defenses. An additional 18,000 men were stationed at Baltimore, while 7,953 more soldiers would arrive from the north over the next week. While McClellan faced Lee, 89,000 Union troops remained in the rear with no enemy to fight other than possibly railroad saboteurs. McClellan responded in part, an order from General Robert E. Lee, addressed to General D.H. Hill, which has accidentally come into my hands this evening, the authenticity of which is unquestionable, discloses some of the plans of the enemy and shows most conclusively that the main rebel army is now before us. Pleasanton's frontline observations and the sound of heavy artillery firing from the southwest, McClellan explained, confirmed that Lee's army had split into five columns and that Harper's Ferry was their primary target. There is but little probability of the enemy being in much force south of the Potomac, McClellan argued. I do not by any means wish to be understood as undervaluing the importance of holding Washington. It is of great consequence. But upon the success of this army, the fate of the nation depends. 
It was for this reason that I said everything else should be made subordinate to placing this army in proper condition to meet the large rebel force in our front. McClellan's response was sent at 11 p.m. While McClellan concluded his letter to Halleck, Sturgis's division closed in on Middletown. The 9th New Hampshire recorded, Midnight approaches, the line dissolves, the men stumble into an adjacent field, drop upon the restful ground, and all is forgotten. Members of Wilcox's division got into camp late, too. David Lee of the 17th Michigan jotted, halted for supper and a few hours rest near Middleton. It was nearly midnight. We had made a rapid march of several miles and were tired and hungry as wolves. At 11.30, McClellan sent orders for Hooker to march at daylight from Middletown. At the same time, orders went out to Sykes for his command to move punctually at 6 o'clock in the morning. At 11.45 p.m., McClellan ordered Burnside to investigate rumors of a large rebel cavalry force just north of Frederick, certainly Fitz Lee's cavalry brigade in Hamburg Pass. At the same time, McClellan responded to an earlier telegram from Governor Curtin asking if he could be of assistance to McClellan. McClellan explained to Curtin a need for the Pennsylvania militia to block the entrance of the Cumberland Valley. As he had urged Halleck three hours earlier, McClellan wrote, You can aid me by concentrating your troops at Chambersburg and keep a lookout for Gettysburg. Among the barrage of telegrams McClellan received that evening, one of special importance came directly from a War Department operator sometime after 9 p.m. It read, Sir, the telegraph line is open to Point of Rocks. The President is at the War Department office and anxious to hear from you. Signal Officer Meyer confirmed in his after-action report that, in the evening, September 13th, a message was received from Washington, transmitted through the signal station at Point of Rocks from the President of the United States to General McClellan. A reply was in the same manner returned. McClellan's return telegram read, To the President, I have the whole rebel force in front of me, which repeats what he had written twice earlier to Halleck, but I'm confident that no time shall be lost. I have a difficult task to perform, but with God's blessing will accomplish it. I think Lee has made a gross mistake, and that he will be severely punished for it. The army is in motion as rapidly as possible. I hope for a great success if the plans of the rebels remain unchanged. We have possession of Catoctin, which was not fully taken until after 1 p.m. I have all the plans of the rebels, and will catch them in their own trap if my men are equal to the emergency. I now feel that I can count on them as of old. All forces of Pennsylvania should be placed to cooperate at Chambersburg repeating again what he had already asked Halleck at 8.45 p.m. and Governor Curtin only 15 minutes earlier. My respects to Mrs. Lincoln, received most enthusiastically by the ladies, will send you trophies. All well, and with God's blessing, will accomplish it. General George B. McClellan. McClellan's return message was sent by signal to the Point of Rock Station, where it was telegraphed to Washington and received by the War Department Two and a half hours later, at 2.35 a.m., September 14th, a transmission time in line with other telegraphic communications from the front throughout the day. Judging by the telegraphic operator's handwriting, the same person who had misinterpreted the timestamp coding of McClellan's midnight letter to Halleck two nights earlier, again incorrectly interpreted the same code word for midnight as noon. However, unlike the September 11th midnight telegram to Halleck, the timestamp on Lincoln's copy appears to have been corrected. This was most likely done by Lincoln himself, who would have added "idnight" to the timestamp 12M, knowing that McClellan could not possibly have responded to his query before it was even asked. McClellan dispatched one final order at 1 a.m. to Major Hayes of the Reserve Artillery. Immediately afterwards, it appears, McClellan finally went to sleep. From the base of South Mountain, to the banks of the Monocacy, the entire Army of the Potomac was finally at rest. But the silence and slumber would only last two hours. At 3 a.m., Union buglers blared and drummers beat out reveille into the cool night air. At sunrise, September 14th, the roads were again packed with Union troops flowing west. And by nightfall, after a severe battle, all three of the critical South Mountain passes were effectively seized. The attack on September 14th did not destroy the Army of Northern Virginia, but it did put an end to any immediate plans that Lee might have for further offensive action in Maryland. 
The lost orders contributed mightily to this outcome by quickening McClellan's resolve to punish Lee's overconfidence. Lee regained his balance at Sharpsburg on September 17th, but on that day, McClellan followed up his victory at South Mountain by inflicting so many casualties on the Army of Northern Virginia that Lee was forced to withdraw. This strategic victory eventually shifted the war in the North's favor by allowing Lincoln to issue the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation only four days later on September 22nd. Elevating the abolition of slavery to an equivalent aim alongside restoration of the Union transformed the war into both a moral crusade and a national political imperative. This outcome never would have materialized had General George B. McClellan, a general with a supposed case of the slows, as Lincoln once put it, not acted decisively and aggressively in Frederick, Maryland on September 13, 1862. Thank you very much for your time in listening to this presentation.